Lastly, we're going to hear from Professor Sundram, a member of the finance faculty at Tuck. His expertise is in valuation, mergers and acquisitions, corporate governance, and financial strategies for profitable growth. He has pioneered many MBA and executive education courses, including the first MBA course on climate change. In 2008, he created the Fossil Fuel Beta, a metric to measure the stock price impact of a company's exposure to fossil fuel price changes and CO2 emissions risks. We're incredibly grateful he can be here with us tonight to provide the financial perspective on divestment and hopefully get some of the dialogue going that we hope to have with you guys for tonight. Thanks. I'm recovering from a broken femur. That's all. I'd like to pick up where Professor McKibben left off, the shanty towns. I first came to Tuck in 1987, and the shanty town was in the green. It was quite impressive. The president of Dartmouth set up an ad hoc council for, to, to explore the issue of divestment from South Africa. And I was the Tuck representative and uh, we recommended divestment. In part because it was easy to do. 26 years later, uh, I'm proud to be, I mean, came, uh, by the way, I came back to talk. Uh, as Morgan just mentioned, I created the first course uh, in a US business school, certainly, on climate change, and it's a course uh, that explores the interactions between business and climate change and diversity is a significant piece of it. What I want to take the next 10 or 15 minutes to do is to raise some issues from a somewhat different perspective, one that you may not think about in, a, in the environmental studies courses uh, that you take, uh, it's on the public policy issues that are raised. But before I do that, let me stipulate a couple of things. I think if we can get to a world with 350 ppm, that is just phenomenal. That 218 would even be better. And I, I, I have deep admiration for people like Professor McKibben who are trying to move the needle, you know, who are trying to create the aspirations to make that happen. That is simply phenomenal. And it's great to see all of you here, obviously passionate about this issue. But let me sort of address the divestment piece of it. How many of you here have taken a class in economics and finance? Because I've got about a minute of jargon that I want to. Okay. So, um, if something doesn't make sense, just turn around and ask the person next to you. <laughs> First, in very simple economics slash finance terms, what is divestment? Simply put, it's getting rid of stocks from your portfolio, or assets from your portfolio, more generally. And in principle, how does it work? You sell, prices fall, and expected returns from that asset then rise, and then we use a bit of finance jargon called, therefore, the cost of capital for the company prices. Therefore, things that were profitable, valuable, or more precisely what we call positive net present value investments before become negative net present value investments, thereby making it unattractive for these companies to invest. And one example of uh, you know, the, that phenomenon at work is what Professor McGibbon mentioned, the notion of unburnable carbon. I'll actually come back to that. Uh, the fact that there are fossil fuel reserves in place today that uh, 5x the amount of fossil fuels, <laughs> I mean, in fact, with 1x or 1.5x, we'll get to a 2 degree centigrade world if the science is to be believed. And, and it is to be believed, as best as we can tell today. But that's presumably how diagnosis works. So let me start with the question Will colleges divesting move the needle? Now, 
According to recent data that I've seen, there are 830 colleges, uh, or data from 830 colleges, uh, they collectively have about 400 to 450 billion dollars in endowment. Of which, 15% are in stocks, in equities, in US stocks, and another 15% in international stocks. Let's just focus on the US for a second. 15%. So that's somewhere between 60 and 75 billion dollars in investments in US stocks. And if you have the same proportion in that 60 to 75 billion as that which is invested in energy, and I'm being broad here, I'm including everything, and I'm going to attribute you know, energy as being equal to fossil fuels just to simplify matters. In this in the US stock market overall, roughly 10 to 12 percent of stocks are in energy. So, 10 to 12 percent of 60 to 75 billion, we're talking about somewhere between six to eight billion dollars in college endowments in energy stocks. Even if we could get rid of that entire lot of six to eight billion, will it move the needle? The answer, unfortunately, is no. Why? Because in the US alone, there's about 1.5 class trillion, <coughs> that 1.5 trillion dollars worth of market cap in energy stock. So we're talking about 0.4 percent, four tenths of one percent of investments that even if colleges were to get rid of. So. Now you might say, look, it's only you know 0.4 percent of the total equity invested uh, in energy. Why not get rid of it anyway? We've got to be extremely careful about a dangerous slip, a slippery slope. I'm passionate about climate issues myself. But there are equally passionate people with extremely legitimate claims to a whole host of issues. Tomorrow we could say, look, we should divest Nike because of child labor, Apple because of suicides at Foxconn, Coca Cola and McDonald's because of obesity, private equity portfolios because of outsourcing, Disney because of fires in Bangladeshi factories. I mean, I could go down the list. Walmart because of guns and bribery in Mexico. Where do we stop? So we've got to be very careful. In other words, if I'm an endowment manager at Dartmouth, I've got to, I mean, there's a bigger picture that I need to worry about. In fact, it probably wouldn't matter a whole heck of a lot to take a little piece of my portfolio and get rid of it for a lot of potential hassles that might arise, but I've got to be extremely careful about the slippery slope. So I worry about, A, the fact that it is unworthy. More important, I worry about the fact that it is potentially unfair, actually borderline unethical. Let me explain why. If for various reasons, think about the role that the endowment plays in an institution like that. Out of the roughly $280 million that Dartmouth spends on tuition, but $80 million is scholarships, assistance. And who does that go to help? The poorer, the less well off amongst you and your colleagues. That's roughly 30, 35% of the tuition that is funded by the endowment. I might be off by a couple of percentage points here or there, but we will come to Look, if it, if it wasn't there, that would be like your parents, the average person here <coughs> or her parent, having to sign an extra $18,000 check <laughs> per year to Dartmouth so that you could afford this $55,000. And I go, if it was easy to get a 350, sorry, 350 ppm without these sorts of trade-offs, you know, where the students that are less able to afford an education such as the one you get from Middlebury or Dartmouth are not affected, I feel like I'm all for it. But, you know, there are trade-offs. In fact, there is another larger kind of unfairness I worry about, which is that it is not just you know, it, it, it's the poorer countries in the world that get affected if fossil fuels were to disappear tomorrow. 85% of our energy comes today from fossil fuels, that's the unfortunate fact. And energy that is cheap and reliable is the basis for wealth creation. You have billions of people, just take India and China, two and a half billion people 
on per capita incomes of roughly $3,000. Aspiring to get to not where the U.S. is today, which is, believe it or not, roughly $45,000 per capita in a country like the U.S., the average Indian or Chinese person is not aspiring to get to $45,000 tomorrow. They're aspiring to get to, and some would say it's actually immoral to deny them that aspiration, aspiring to get to maybe $15,000 per capita, 15 years from now. You can do the math. I mean, they can't get there without cheap, reliable energy. And today, unfortunately, that comes from fossil fuels. So there's this element of unfairness tomorrow if we get rid of fossil fuels um, that we have to worry about. Three, it actually kind of troubles me that this is <coughs> unnecessary. And why do I say that? Look, at the end of the day, <clears throat> countries don't end. Companies end. People. And companies emit power because they're the ones that ultimately burn the fossil fuels too. And, and they don't do that because they wake up in the morning and say, hey, today I'm going to end. No. They're producing goods and services for you and I, we, the people, that we want to consume. And unfortunately, as I said, the nature of this production system today is 85% of the world's energy comes from fossil fuels. And then you might say, heck, if they're responsible for it, they're darn well responsible for making sure that we transition to a world in which this becomes less of an issue. And guess what? That is exactly what is happening. There's a remarkable amount of things happening under the radar in the forward-thinking companies in the world. That is stunning. I spent a lot of time in that world. You'd be amazed at how companies are trying to get in front of the carbon issue trying to become more carbon efficient in everything that they do, trying to use non-fossil fuel-based sources of energy in everything that they do. But the transition is not easy, cheap, costly. In fact, it is not just your regular manufacturing companies that are doing this. It is actually many fossil fuel-based companies. They worry about stranded assets. They worry about the carbon bubble. They worry about assets that in a world of the price of carbon, that could suddenly you know, be worthless. They're not stupid. They want to get in front of it. But, in, in fact, just as a quick aside, pretty much every European oil company has signed on to a carbon pledge. And they are all for the cap and trade system in Europe at this point. In fact, when in 2009 we had a huge policy debate here on the mess of the bill for the Blackman Marquee, uh, but, you know, it came into the it didn't come into being, came up for discussion, actually got to a point where the chevrons of the world, where they won't like the cap and trade, but we could convince them of a carbon tax, even you know, Exxon Mobil. My point is, many people are already trying to get in front of this issue. They, you know, I, I prefer a situation in which we work with these organizations to say, look guys, how can we move the needle? Let me finally end with one final point. I, I really worry, you know, at the end of the day, yes, it's maybe unfair, uh, it's perhaps unworkable, uh, maybe it's unnecessary. And I also ask myself, is this really Climate-friendly policy. I think it's actually kind of unclimate-friendly. What do I mean by that? Look, when you strip away a lot of complexities, there are only three ways to deal with climate change. You can say, I've got two burnt fossil fuels, but I'll be more carbon efficient in the way that I do. Two, you say, look, I need energy. I've got to maybe start thinking of non-fossil fuel-based sources of energy to do this. But three, there's another remarkable potential technology that's still around the corner that the global policy community has finally recognized a huge war for. That is to say, look, there's a limit to how much of the first two that I can do. Maybe I can burn fossil fuels, but I can figure out intelligent, smart, sustainable, safe ways to capture the carbon that I burn, put out there, and put it away from the carbon capture and sequestration is what we call CCS technology. And you know who's at the forefront of that technology? It's the oil companies. Why? Because it's a technology that they use to enhance their oil recovery. They pump CO2 under the ground. The point that I'm simply getting at is to say, look, can we find a way to work with these companies? Can we find a way to channel your passion, your energies, that instead of an in your face approach that says, oh, get rid of it, and may not even move the needle for all we know, instead say, guys, do the right thing. 
and work with, form partnerships with these fossil fuel-based companies to transition to the right world. And let me end there.